setup it will not work and we are saying hello here to our confirmation bias because actually we looked for all kind of proofs to uphold our beliefs and we kind of dismissed all the contrary information telling us hey remote work actually works remote sprints do work we kept on going with our with this bias and we believe that well we are definitely not going to be able to provide the same experience and reach the same outcomes as we do with in-person workshops and with in-person uh, meetings, for example. So yeah, we need to accept that. And on top of that, we added a status quo bias when we decided, no, nah, we are not going to do it because why change something or why fix something that doesn't need fixing, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of stayed in this area and I can say that for the last past years, since we've been running multiple design sprints and problem framing workshops, we haven't done a remote type of workshop. I mean, we're doing it for preparing for the preparing workshops. And with small exceptions in the problem framing area, but not an end-to-end -end design sprint with our clients in a, in a remote I mean, in person was so Easy. rewarding and it was working so great, workshops, training, everything. So exactly. why change why that? Why change that? So please give a plus one in the comments if you empathize with that or if you have been in this type of situation or you feel that mm, I said no to things just because I liked how things were going the way they were. This will help us like see if anyone <laughs> is in the same uh, situation as we were. <laughs> yeah. As you all know, thank you so much. I see my plus one there. Thank you. March came with COVID in Germany and it was like a complete lockdown and any type of in-person design sprints or in-person workshops were like suspended. So yeah, we had to wake up really quickly. I mean, yeah, we have, we have a business that- <laughs> We have a business that depends on in-person yeah. meetings and workshops. So yeah, it kind of <laughs> stroke a chord there. But that wasn't the only reason that um, pushed us into the change. It, the fact that remote collaboration is here to stay and it was always here. And all the companies that we work with, basically they do have distributed teams everywhere. And not only that, we started to getting more and more client inquiries, like when can we do this uh, as a remote workshop? Where can we meet remotely? Because we cannot bring everyone on site as we would like to. And of course, with this situation, it's even, even harder. So yeah, that told us, okay, you need to say goodbye to your biases and come on and change. So it was time to change for us. But again, I'm going to ask you for a plus one. If in the moment that change is coming towards you, you feel fear because that's what we felt, fear of failure. Our first question was, okay, we're going to do this remote, but how are we going to facilitate remote design sprints overnight since we haven't done it before? And of course, we kind of, do I say plus one here, plus two? <laughs> plus <Thank> two. You. <laughs> Timothy is adding to, to her first one, to his first one, yeah. So yeah, fear of failure, right? And even worse, fear to disappoint, because our question was, how will we ensure we get the same great result for our clients when the stakes are high, right? Mm -hmm. Because our clients expect that from us. For them, there's no excuse. Now, oh God, you're now remote. What, you cannot deliver the same thing? So with those fears in our heart and mm -hmm. in our process, we thought of, okay, what can we do? And we decided to leave anxiety behind and do the same thing that we coach our clients to do. First, understand the challenges, understand, contextualize the problem and really see what's going on. Then second step would be shift our perspective, try to look at this problem from different angles. And only lastly, develop some solutions to get us out of the mess. So that's what we did. Now, in order to understand the challenge, we did a little bit of research. As you probably know, there are tons of resources out there, tools, uh, best practices, tips and tricks from other remote facilitators telling you how things need to be done, uh, what you need to pay attention to, what's happening, what are some challenges and barriers. But we decided to look at, those, at this information with the doctor's hat on 
and we looked at all the facilitation tips and advices as the pills or as the medicine that other facilitators use to deploy. And then we looked at all the problems and challenges as the symptoms, like what do they see and what type of pills do mm -hmm. they provide in order to fix that symptoms. And that helped us like gain this overview of what's going on and how the entire ecosystem looks like. So we had pills and symptoms, <laughs> which were not enough for us because it's very important to shift our perspective. And we are like really big fans of root problems, of root causes oh, yeah. of the problems. So we used all kinds of tools and methods like the fishbone um, analysis and also like the bow tie risk assessment analysis to dive a little bit deeper and see what actually caused that symptom. And we discovered all kinds of um, triggers that happen at the level of technology, knowledge, process, motivation, people, and we could dive deep into understanding what caused all those things to appear. So that was super important for us to discover. And not only that, we also wanted to shift our perspective, like what are the problems of the facilitator? What are the challenges of a facilitator versus what are the team sprint challenges? And to our surprise, or maybe not so much surprise, they differ. They are not the same. What we as facilitator fear or we find as difficult might not feel the same way on the other side when it comes to your sprinting. But at one point, they do intersect and they do are they, they are the same. And that's ineffective team collaboration. When that happens, you have a lose-lose situation because in the end, you're going to end up with a, with a design sprint with poor results. And that's something that we don't no want, no one wants to have. But we, we found this middle, middle ground between those two types of uh, challenges. Now, with this shift in perspective, we were kind of ready to develop some solutions and see how we are going to bring some light in, in the mess. And as you probably know, there are two things you can do. You can deploy proactive strategies that help you prevent problems before they arise, or you can de deploy reactive strategies that mean uh, reacting to a problem after it occurs or in the moment. And since we were already engaged in running the design sprint with our client, we thought, okay, let's just see what we can do beforehand in order to prevent all the things that might go wrong throughout the sprint. And today we're going to focus on um, oh, sorry. On, two, on two proactive strategies, not all of them on, on planning and onboarding. We kind of took more than seven weeks to find all the proactive strategies that you can find in order to fix all the problems that might occur in a design sprint that are related to the process, technology, knowledge, motivation, and people interaction. And while we've been creating them, we ended up with building our own kit, our own sprint kit, our own tools, mm -hmm. mural boards, agenda, everything that could help us actually solve the problems before they arise. And um, today in this uh, webinar, we're just going to talk about two of them, the remote sprint plan and the team onboarding. Now, going to the remote sprint plan, we build it in a very modular and versatile way in order to help us prevent the lack of availability, because that's one of the problems that it's always there. Like not all the team members are available, maybe the decider is not available when you want them to be. But having this modular setup helped us shift all different all, all the sessions at different times to allow everyone who's important to be there. We also included offline with online um, sessions, exercises, so that we remove the cognitive fatigue, the screen time fatigue, the information overall, uh, overload, um, the unreal unrealistic expectations. We also created space for people to think in silence and also to collaborate together. And we removed the confusion of a poor mix of divergent and convergent thinking exercises by setting, up, setting them up in the right way. And we also ensure that we ditch the lack of engagement just then, mm -hmm. by the way, we stage the process. And next, uh, John is going to take you to, to in a more detailed view of, of what this remote sprint plan actually looks like. Right. Because as Dana said, 
before before we even started our first design sprint, we were trying to foresee everything that would happen. And obviously, one of the first thing was, can we run a design sprint in the same way as we would run it in person? And I think like we discussed a lot and we said, no, we did some tests and we could, we could see that everything takes so much longer um, online, um, online than, than in person. So as a result of everything that we've tested, our research, our, our knowledge so far, right? Um, we came up with this, um, with this plan. As you can see, it's, uh, we're doing it over five days. Um, this is uh, this is the sprint plan, right? So I'm not taking into consideration the work you're doing before the sprint, which is the problem framing, your groundwork, gathering information, all of the logistics. So that's not in here. We're focusing just on the actual sprint um, itself. So we're doing it in five days. Um, when we're doing it in person, we're doing it over four days. So it's one extra day. And if you can see at the end, we, we added something that's called a moving forward agenda, which by the way, it's a good idea to do it in person as well, if, you, if you're running a design sprints. Um, anyway, the sprint, uh, the sprint plan, the sprint structure, um, it's very modular. And as, as you can see, it's um, a series of online and offline sessions. None of them is longer than two hours, right? So they're, they're quite short and anyway even in these two hours you still have some some short breaks and uh, the good thing about it is that you can almost run them as their own mini workshops so you want to do an ideation workshop just run a how might we session right you want to set a direction for something uh, do some uh, lightning talks you want to do a mapping exercise you have it right so you can you can run them individually the other advantage with having um, this modular structure is you don't need to block to find five straight days in someone's calendar. You just need to see, okay, when is my team available for a session, right? And then just work with that. That's why you can either run it in one week or five days, or you can spread it over 10 days. You have the flexibility to, to do so. And then there is um, a trick on how on the sequence of these uh, sessions, but I'm going to go day by day and, uh, and explain them. So I'll start, with, uh, I'll start with day one. Day one, when we start the sprint, we, uh, we have uh, two online sessions. We have one offline session. The first one is uh, the lightning talks where we introduce the sprint challenge and then everyone shares their own uh, perspective um, over it. Um, I'm going to show you the onboarding a bit later, but during the lightning talks, we're basically using information we're already captured in the onboarding, which makes it for a very smooth start. So we're not putting people on the spot. All right, Joe, what's your opinion about the sprint challenge? And Joe's like, what? <laughs> you know, so no, Joe knows what the sprint challenge is. We've already discussed. He has his uh, talking points. Right, so it's something that's staged, is prepared, you know, and that's why we can keep it uh, in time because everyone knows what uh, what they're doing. And then once this uh, session is over, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, once this uh, once this session is uh, is over, we have an offline uh, session here where um, the team can uh, review any research material, reading material. Um, most of the times we go into the screens preparing a map, you know, so that's something that they do during the offline period where they look over the customer journey map, you know, they get really familiar with it and yeah, everything that we've prepared um, ahead of uh, time. Yes, I mean, even if you're sending them onboarding emails, if you, even if you're sending them reading materials before the sprint, there are chances that some people from the team, they will not do it, which is why we really want to give them this time in the sprint to, to get a chance to, to look over the materials. And we're also kind of threatening them and we're telling them that, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> we're telling them that yeah, that's something we're going to review together when we get back. Anyway, uh, then there's the lunch break. So basically the team has uh, a break of two hours almost, right from 1 to 1, uh, from 11 to 1 p.m where they don't necessarily need to be on a call, you know, and, and talk to other people. So it's, and then they enjoy a nice uh, lunch break. And then in the afternoon, uh, we get back together and um, we basically use that session for alignment, 
we're um, reviewing the customer journey map, we're adding to it. Uh, if, if there's anything that needs to, to be added uh, to it, generally we're doing a pain point, you know, and desired outcomes or whatever the context might be. And then we, as everyone is very familiar now with the sprint challenge, with the research, they're familiar with uh, the customer journey map with our user, they have all of this knowledge. It's really easy to close with the long-term goal and the sprint question. It's a very, very easy exercise. Now, because this session is at the end of the day, just in case we have more discussion on the customer journey maps, we have enough time to, to go over. Because normally we'd need to finish by 3 p.m., but it can easily go to, to 4 p.m. It's still not a very long day. So that would make the first day of the design sprint. We end up with a long-term goal and sprint questions, and everyone's aligned on what we have to want to do. Moving on to it's the second day. Second day, we're starting it with expert interviews, right? As you know, yes, you do have experts in your team, but sometimes you might need an outside perspective, right? Or very specific expertise. And that's why we're bringing these experts. We have um, time for two of them. Um, and they each have about 30 minutes to share their, um, their experience or their perspective, the information that they have, and the team captures um, everything. We then have a half an hour break once we once we do that, and then we do how my tweets and we're doing how my tweets as a standalone exercise that's uh, actually a feature of design sprint 3.0 we're doing the same in uh, when we're doing sprint in person. And why is that because how my tweets is all about reframing challenges into opportunities and we were taking into consideration multiple sources for um, for the how my tweets it's the lightning talks at the beginning of day one. Um, it's the user research that's already on the map, and it's the output of the expert interviews. So the team has three different sources to get inspiration for their how might ways. So that's uh, that really um, helps them get with with much better uh, results here. And also, we want to give them the time to really reflect when they're coming with them, as opposed to automatically translating from whatever someone is, is saying. So we have a How Might We session, which is about uh, one hour, and we close it with picking a target on the map. We do the How Might We voting and all of that stuff. And then once that's done, uh, we move into, and we know the How Might We people go offline, and each of them are doing their homework to find um, research, to find inspiration for their lightning nouns. And again, if they need a little bit more time, they have it because it also combined with the lunch break, again, two hours from the screen, from the team. And then we get back together to do the lightning demos and everyone does a presentation and we do crazy eight and evil eight, um, these exercises together. Evil eight is a new exercise we introduced into the sprint to remove pressure to perform. Maybe we can send you the link uh, in, in here and then Solution sketching, it's something that everyone does on their own. This is how we close the day. We give it as homework. And we uh, and basically, some people would take one hour to do it and they would submit the solution, but other people would take maybe the entire afternoon. Maybe other people would do it uh, in the evening with a glass of wine. I don't know, I don't care. But what's really, really important is what we've noticed in this remote sprint the level of detail and quality in solution is much better because people don't have that pressure and they have the time to do it at their own pace without the facilitator. Come on, give me the solution. Time's up, time's up. So we've seen really, really good results with the solution uh, sketch. So we're ending day two. We have solutions to each of the, to each of the problem. And then um, we're moving into the third day of the design sprint. We're kicking off with um, rested, arrested brain. with a rested brain, <laughs> rested brain <laughs> for making decisions. Did you want to say something? No, no, no. <laughs> now I lost my flow. Anyway, <laughs> so we're starting the day with um, with evaluating all of the solutions, voting, discussing them. Generally, this process goes really, really well um, online, um, and uh, we can we can keep it on time uh, quite uh, quite easily. Um, and then we end, uh, we end by voting. And then we have two storyboarding sessions. The first one we dedicated to build a user flow 
write a storyline based on everything that's been voted and um, to have that story, you know, so like, okay, this is the foundation of our storyboard of our prototype. And then we have a break, um, you know, how storyboard is, is a challenging exercise, you know, people get the lunch break, they cool off. And then we get back into the afternoon and um, basically we add uh, meat to the bones, which means we're designing every screen or stage of the, of the storyboard. And we end the day by doing a prototype planning, saying, okay, who's going to build a prototype? Who's going to gather assets? Who's doing copywriting? Who's doing the interview script? So we're ending the day with prototype planning because some people might want to um, get a head start, you know, and already start working on day three. But regardless, it's really important that everyone knows what they have to do on um, day four. Well, so day four, it's about prototype, not much of a difference from an in-person uh, sprint. Uh, it's mostly offline, but we do insist on having uh, team status check-ins every 90 minutes or so, just to make sure that we're all in track and um, everyone's aligned. Uh, by 4 p.m., we're finishing the prototype, and then the whole team gets together to do a trial run um, and see how the prototype works, you know, and just, um, I don't know, rehearse the uh, user interview and see that, um, yeah, everything falls into place. Maybe we get to do some small adjustments. And then the last day is something everyone's familiar with. Uh, we start the morning by briefing the team on how they should um, take notes, right, how they should gather the feedback because it's really important to capture it. And then we have the user testing sessions. Right? So that's kind of uh, how the remote sprints end. Incidentally, it's five days, you know, kind of classic from that perspective. And then once you've done the sprint, what we do, uh, we, we do a report. It takes a few days to compile everything to make sense of the data, of the results, of the, what the users said. But anyway, we're putting this into, into these big reports. And that's something that we bring into this moving forward um, workshops. That's a very quick uh, two to three hour workshop we do with stakeholders, where we basically uh, present what happened into the sprint and they get to make decisions on how to move forward. Whether there's iteration sprint or they move into execution or they kill the project or they do something else, right? It's something up to, to them. and. Yeah, we, we facilitate that uh, kind of decision making. Yeah, yeah and uh, if we're looking at the outcomes, uh, day one, after day one, we're finishing with a clear direction uh, for the sprint and everyone is aligned, right? We really understand what we're working on. Day two is all about coming with very different ideas and solutions to, to the problem. That's like the, the main part of day two. During day three, we make sure that we evaluate all of the solutions in a very fair process, right? Everyone's voice is being heard. We, we extract the best ideas and we use them to, to put them into a prototype, right? And then, um, yeah, day four, it's about coming up with a functional realistic prototype and day five, which is uh, why we're doing design printer, getting the, uh, the user uh, feedback and you know how you've answered your sprint questions that you were set out to at the beginning of the week.